for about 100 years ago. Uh, it runs at 15 kilohertz carrier frequency. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Very fancy. Yeah. <laughs> it was built for communication between Sweden and the US. So there was actually a network of these radio stations across the globe. And I think this is the only one that's still left and that is operational. So they, they run it uh, once a year to celebrate. Oh, it's like actually world heritage. It's well worth a visit. It still works. <laughs> it still works, that means. Yeah. So it, it's where my engineering was marble and brass and it's really pretty installations. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, things have progressed, so it looks a little bit more fancy nowadays. Communication. Maybe I don't need to do a recap. I don't, hopefully I haven't forgotten everything just after a 15 minute coffee break. Yeah, but we, we talked a little bit about in NR in general, we talked about architecture and then time frequency structure. So. This session until lunch, we will jump into the transport channel processing and multi antenna transmission. And as before, I mean, do, do stop me when you have questions. So the, uh, the transport channel, that's basically a, that as a term used in 3PP, it's the kind of interface between Mac and fiscal A, you can say, or how a one Mac protocol communicates with its peer entity. So basically on this transport channel comes one or, or sometimes two transport blocks of a dynamic size from the Mac layer and go through all these processing steps in the physical layer and then out to the antenna. So this is basically the physical layer. And it's uh, on a high level fairly standard. We, we add the CRC code, we do some error correcting coding, scrambling. We, we have a little bit of layer mapping for multi-antenna stuff we talk about and then we, we put it out on, on, the, on the antenna side. So that's the topic for the session until lunch. So I, I will go through step by step here and talk a little bit about these boxes. Some of them I will cover more in detail and some more just uh, overviewish. Coding. Uh, in, in comes this transport block. Uh, we attach a CRC to the end for error detection to see whether the transport block was an error or not so that we can request a retransmission. And then if this uh, transport block is very big, we chop it up into code blocks and run the error correcting code on each of these code blocks. And each of these code blocks also get a CRC. So you can actually see if one of the code blocks is an error or not. And you can actually, as we'll see later on, retransmit just a missing code block instead of the whole transport block. Other than that, it's uh, standard CRC attachment, nothing strange. So, so this happens always. So if you have a kind of a transport block which fits into one code block, you have two CRCs. Or no, I think you attached it. It's just if you have multiple code blocks, you you put in this additional CRC. Okay. If you have a small transport block that fits into one code block, then then you just have the the red CRC. Otherwise, you, you will increase over. But if you, if you have a very large transport block, yes, then you have both the red and the green CRCs in this figure. And then, but the CRC is relatively small, so it, it, the additional overhead is not that much. Because the code block is up to 6,000 something bits or something in, in that range. And then coding, it, it's uh, LDPC coding. Uh, unlike 3D and 4D, where we use turbo codes. Uh, and it was quite a big coding discussion in 3 pp What coding scheme to use? Should we go for turbo coding, LDPC coding, or polar coding? Uh, and in the end, uh, there was a lot of uh, comparison between the th three different schemes, and different companies came to different conclusions, and and so on. But in the end, we we, we settled for LDPC codes uh, for for the data part, and that's uh, it's a good choice because they are quite nice to, to from processing perspective when you do very high date rates and want to, to process and decode rapidly. And then a, a lot of effort was went into designing the, the, um, the, the these things, the base graphs and when to use which base graph and so, so on. So the, the coding experts were, were busy with that. But the, the, the net thing is that it, it's a good choice for, for efficient decoding at high date rates. So, so in addition to the decoding and perhaps encoding efficiency, so let's say you said that different, uh, let's say 
the uh, how say coding gain benefits kind of indicated that it was kind of somewhat unconclusive inconclusive. Yeah. It, it turned out to be a very political discussion as well. Uh, but mm -hmm. I, I think it's fair to say that the, the performance wise, uh, if you look at Blair versus SNR, all three alternatives were, were kind of similar. So there's no big difference there. Uh, the difference was more on which decode is easy to implement. And there are different campuses have different views uh, for, for a lot of different reasons. Okay. But it was a highly political discussion as well. So yeah. and, and polar coding, which was favored by, by China, that was chosen for, for the control channels as part of this compromise package. So the PC coding for, for data. Okay. And then we do the next step is rate matching. Uh, and what is that? Well, that is the idea of adapting the number of coded bits. It, it's basically adjusting the code rate so that if you have a certain size of your uh, transport block coming in here at the top, and you have a, a certain amount of, of resources at the bottom, time frequent resources. Then, of course, when you do the coding, you want to code your own payload and it must fit into, into that scheduled uh, amount of resources. So you need to fine tune your, your code rate. And that is exactly what you do with rate matching. You basically puncture or, or adjust the, the, um, the coded bits so that it fits. And it's done in, in such a way that you, you put in all the, the coded bits into kind of a circular buffer like this. And then you start at one point. And the, the first uh, transmission is the blue one. You start redundant version zero, then you actually transmit as many coded bits as you can fit in, in the in the time frequency resources you schedule. So that is the blue arrow here. And that could be the, the systematic bits and maybe some coded bits as well, depending uh, or parity bits, depending on, on how many resources you have scheduled. And then if you want need to do a retransmission, then you have the possibility to try retransmit another redundant version. So you can choose to retransmit the, the green arrow, a different set of parity bits, and then try to decode the combination of blue and green, and hopefully that works. If not, then you can retransmit to the, also the, the red bits and try to decode again, and so on, until you get through with your, your transmission. And then there are also some tricks on linear buffer rate matching. I, I won't spend too much time on that, but uh, if you want to do this retransmission with incremental redundancy, as it's called, that you transmit additional parity bits when the packet is in error, uh, then you need to buffer the soft bits for, from the previous transmissions of that packet, that data packet, that transport block. That, of course, takes some buffer memory. And if, if you have a very large uh, transport block, big user payload, and, and you code that, then you get quite a big buffer. So in order to to limit the amount of buffer memory you need to implement in, in, in your terminal, you can actually do um, set a limit on the amount of soft buffers that, so that you, you're not able to, to buffer all the parity bits. You can just buffer up to this point. So instead of going the whole way around the circle buffer, you, you go up to here, for example, then you jump back to the beginning again. Things like that. And for, for smaller transport blocks, then the bits will fit in the soft buffer, so it's not an issue. So it's, it's to handle complexity in, in the in the user side. You can also do it in the, in the uptake. Excuse me. So doesn't now this circular buffer, doesn't that also make incremental redundancy possible then? Because you have the green and the, the blue and the green arrow, they in, in that incremental redundancy now. Yes, exactly. I mean, the, these four arrows here in different colors, they are four different sets of coded bits representing the same transport block. And then you can transmit more and more of these arrows until you, you get through with your packet. That's the idea. And then you, you combine. So you, after two transmissions, you use the combination of the blue and the green to, to try to decode. And after three transmissions, you use the blue, green, and red to try to decode and so on. It's called incremental redundancy because for each retransmission you add a little bit more of redundancy to your your payload. 
And it, it's a similar way, it's done in a similar way in, in uh, LTE, so it's fairly, fairly similar. The details differ, of course, because the coding scheme is different, but the, the general thinking is the same. And then when we're done rate matching, we, we do scrambling. Uh, and that's basically a scrambling to um, randomize the decoded bits. Uh, so it's based on something called that a cell-specific radio network temporary identifier. It, it's a, it's basically an identity of, of the device that you, that's unique within the cell that you get. Or you can link it to the cell identity if you want to do that on a configured identity. So the, the purpose of scrambling here is to randomize uh, the, the data transmission. So different users get the data scrambled in different ways. So that, that, there's no risk that you decode someone else's data, so to say, or that you, in the decoding process, when you do the de scrambling, you randomize the interference so it looks like white noise and, and then it can be handled by, by the error correcting code. Modulation, nothing strange. Yeah, there's a kind of set of modulation schemes. Uh, you can actually do pi half BPSK as well uh, if you do DFT spread uh, over them in the applic. And that is uh, the reason for that is that pi half BPSK has an even lower power, so you can gain a little bit in, in coverage there with ID. Can you do, lay, yeah? What's your question? No, no, no. no. Okay. Then you do layer mapping, so that basically means if you want to do MIMO, you want to, let's say, two-layer MIMO, then you split out the, the, the coded uh, uh, modulated modulation symbols across two, two layers, so every second symbol to every second layer, and, and so on. And you can do up to four layers for a transfer block. If you want to do eight layers, then you actually have two transfer blocks. You do coding and scrambling in twice, one for each transfer block. And then in the uplink, you, you can configure this transform pre-coding if you want to do DFT pre-coding. And then we get to the more interesting part because so far all the steps have been fairly kind of standard. There's nothing surprising on, on, on this uh, high level at least. Then of course could be details and, and so on, but uh, you can find the, the general thinking in any textbook. But then we, we get to, to multi-antenna pre-coding. And that is basically, uh, as illustrated here, you have the layer mapping, the different MIMO layers. You feed that through a pre-coding matrix. And mm -hmm. out comes uh, pre-coded layers. Uh, and that is fed into the whatever antenna setup you have at, at the transmitter side. It could be uh, as many antennas as you have layers, or it could be more. Maybe have two layers, but about uh, 10 antennas. That I can do, and that, that's an implementation thing. And that I model here as the, the, the matrix F. And then that is, goes through the radio channel, which has some certain properties, and is received by the receiver, and then you try to decode the data. So the, the idea here is that we feed in la from layer mapping the different transmission layers, and then we also have uh, the modulation reference signals that are also included. And as you see, they pass through the same set of processing steps as the data. But the only thing I need to do at the receiver side is to look at the, the, the reference signals and estimate the, the overall channel, both the radio channel, the, this FISC antenna setup, and the, the, the transmission precoding. So it's basically this red box that I estimate at, at the receiver. And on the receiver side, I don't care if it comes from the radio channel or the physical antenna setup or the pre matrix W, it doesn't matter. The only thing I need to know is what happened to the data from the layer mapping until it came to the receiver, and that I can get from this reference signals. So from a data reception perspective, I don't need to know W and F, I estimate that from the, from the reference signals. Uh, why are they then separately discussed, W and F? Yeah, I think uh, the hint comes here from a data reception perspective. There are some, we will see that in coming slides, but when you want to to report uh, or feedback channel estimates, then sometimes you assume a certain codebook for W and so on. But uh, otherwise, they, they are in the downlink. Uh, from a data transmission, you don't even talk about W and F, they're just kind of implicit. 
But we will see when we may get to channel quality reporting that there are some difference sometimes. Okay. It makes sense to have them separate on the slide. And if you look on, on the on the downlink here, uh, this was a generic figure, it goes for both uplink and downlink. And then we zoom in on the downlink. It's the same type of uh, approach. Uh, we have the layer mapping, we have the DMRS, and then we have the pre-coding matrix W. The specification doesn't tell you anything what what the W should look like. Pick whatever you want. And then it goes through resource mappings. We put it in the right place in the in the time frequency resource, right of them, symbol, right subcarrier, and so on, and go through the, the physical antennas that, that sits on the base station. Yep. And as I said, I mean, for, from a data reception perspective, it is perfectly fine to just look at the, the DMRs at the receiver side, estimate the channel, and, and then modulate and so on. But I also want to have uh, some reporting back. I would like to, to give some hints to the base station on what the radio channel looks like. So give some advice what type of pre-coding operation is, is good in order to get a high data rate and good quality. And for that, I can insert channel state information reference signals. And they are inserted after the W. But the intention of those is that they just go through the uh, the transmit antenna setup and on the radio channel. And then the U we can measure on those CSIRs and report back to the base station that I think that this W is a good choice. But then the base station does whatever it wants. It can follow that advice or it can take additional information into account that uh, what some other UVs recommend and come, on, come, to this, come to different conclusion and then pick whatever W it wants. It's basically for that reason I separated W and F from this figure because you wanted to measure the radio channel report back to the to the base station. Uh, is this a generic way to do it in TDD as well? Yes, you can do it in TDD. You don't have to. I mean, uh, whether you have CSIRS or not, uh, it's up to, to you. You don't have to configure it. Another way to do it in TDD is, of course, to do um, if you, you know in your system that you have some form of short term reciprocity in the channel, you could, in principle, send uh, sounding reference signals in the uplink from the device to the base station. The base station measures, figures out what the radio channel looks like, and from that draws a conclusion of what W that makes sense to apply in the downlink because the, the radio channel is reciprocal especially in the PDD setup. So that, that you can do, or you can use a combination of CSI feedback and reciprocity based beam forming. But, 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 but from, from the standard perspective, I would imagine that there should be some, let's say, requirements on UV hardware, which makes reciprocity possible. So yeah, that, that's right. There are requirements in place uh, on performance and things like that, so that it, it is possible to do reciprocity. But you don't have to use it if you don't want to, but uh, it, it's possible. Okay. And one thing with reciprocity based beam forming is, of course, that you, the, the radio channel is reciprocal. So from, from that, that part, you can get from reciprocity. But the, the interference situation at the UE, that knows reciprocal. So the, it could be good to have some complementary CSIRs just to report the the interference situation at the UV as well, if that can affect the the, the choice of the W. So there's, there's a whole range of things you can do here. It, it, it's a very very wide area, but the specification allows you to do a lot of different things. So it doesn't mandate any particular algorithm. Thank you. And then if you, if you look in the uplink. You see, it's the same generic setup. Uh, we have the, 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 more, the layers, we have the DMRS, and we go through the W and the antenna and radio channel. And so, from a, again, from a data reception perspective, we don't need to, to um, bother with, with the W and F. But since the base station is in control of what the user shall transmit, and when, and so on. It also has the possibility to tell the UV that it should apply a certain W. 
because the base dash figure out that if the UV applies a certain W, then I get a very good performance. And in order to do that, I can instruct the device to send sounding reference signals, the same sounding reference signals I talked about before, if you want to do reciprocity based beamforming. That is something that the, the UV can send in the uplink. The base dash can measure on, on those sounding reference signals figure out what W that would be good for this device. And then in the scheduling grant, tell the device, transmit with this data rate, uh, this modulation scheme, and use this pre-coding matrix. And then the UEM must use that pre-coding matrix. And then, of course, they're listed in the specification as a table here with what, what uh, possible Ws you can choose from. But there are also an, another way of doing uplink uh, pre-coding error, non-code book-based pre-coding, where, where the device actually can choose its W by itself. And we will see those two in, 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 the, in the coming slides. Okay, but before doing that, we, we let's talk a little bit about the DMRs. We have the reference signals here uh, that we use to estimate the, the radio channel. Uh, and it's an extremely flexible design. Uh, and you have a lot of choices here. You can choose type one or type two. You can choose mapping type A or B. You can choose one or two symbol long, and you can choose additional time domain configuration. So you have a lot of different setups to choose from. Uh, and the, uh, but you see that they are fairly similar in the sense here that if I want to do, let's say four layer transmission, the two first layers, they, they are on top of each other, so they are separated in, in the code domains. So I have length two orthogonal codes here, plus plus on that one and plus minus on that one. So it's the same underlying pseudo noise or random sequence, but then I multiply it with, with uh, an orthogonal sequence so that these two layers get orthogonal reference signals in the code domain. Same thing for, for layer three and four. And then these two layers, they are separated in the frequency domain. You see the the green and orange, they are fit in where it's empty for the blue and, and pink and vice versa. So that's where I, I, I can uh, generate a number of different uh, layers. In this case, up to four layers. Then I can set up double symbol referencing. Then I do orthogonal code also in the time domain, not just in frequency domain. Then I can code multiplex four different codes and frequency multiplex with four other, four other locations. And in total, I get eight different uh, reference signals. So then I can do eight layer MIMO at most with this setup. And here I can do at most four layer MIMO. And it is a similar approach here for, for type two, uh, but here I can actually get up to 12 DMRs. You see they're a little bit sparser in the frequency domain, on the other hand, I, I can have more, more codes. I can get a larger number of reference signals in the code domain. So this is mainly intended for multi-user mind. If I want to schedule multiple users on top of each other on the same time frequency resource, but uh, then I would like to have at least orthogonal reference signals. I can estimate the different radio channels or different users in a good way. Whereas this type one is more intended for single user MIMO. It's a very, very flexible setup. I mean, you, you configure which uh, configuration you want. If you, let's say you want two layers with this configuration, then you set up the blue and, and, and purple one. Then I can put out reference signals in many different ways in the time domain as well. Uh, you see here in the blue, blue ones. And then I get into the mapping type A or B. Uh, so this mapping type A, that's basically when, when I do slot-based transmission. There, when I, if I want to run my system so that the data starts at the slot boundary all the time. Whereas mapping type B is if I wanted to be able to schedule it at any point in time, and an arbitrary of them symbol. They look fairly similar. You see, I can configure more and more reference symbols. And depending on, on how long of, of a scheduling duration I have, if I schedule 14 symbols or seven or so, they end up at different places here. And of course, if I just have one reference symbol configured, then it, it occurs at the beginning, which is good for latency. And this is probably a good choice for, for low mobility scenarios. 
Uh, but if you have a high Doppler, if, if you want to run your devices, you have a base station next to a highway or something like that, it's probably good to have a larger number of, of reference symbols uh, because the channel varies over a few of them symbols. Then you want more, more reference symbols in order to, to follow the channel variation better. So then you, you probably configure something like this. Whereas in an indoor or cells with just pedestrians or something like that, you, you can probably do with this configuration. So it's an extremely flexible setup of, of uh, referencing, you see, that you can specify the dense and the time domain and uh, how many different layers you want and so on. So it's, it's, it's a lot of flexibility here. All in order to, to be able to handle a wide range of deployment scenarios. And then if, if you look at this data map again here, I've configured two reference symbols. Uh, and if I just do single, single A transmission, then it would look like this. The first two of them symbols are probably used for control signaling. I have my blue reference signals, and then I put in my, my gray data around those blue signals. Fairly straightforward. And on the device side, I, I use the blue ones to estimate the channel, and then <coughs> they can decode the gray data symbols. If I want to do uh, either, I, I want to do a, a multi-user MIMO, or I could even do single-use MIMO to one, one, one UE. Then I leave those resources in between the blue ones empty because there I would like to have reference signals for, for the other device. These are two, two, two different UE scheduled on the same resources, multi-user MIMO. Then I, then I leave those empty and I start to the gray data after reference signals. The same thing, I leave it empty here as well, so that the, the red ones can fit in there, in order not to interfere the, the reference symbols for the other device to get a good channel estimate. And the UV is told as part of the, the scheduling information that whether it should do like this or like that. So the blue user doesn't need to know about the red user, but the blue user needs to know whether there's data in between here or not. And that information gets from the base station. And there's also another reference signal, the PTRS, the um, face tracking, tracking reference signal. And they, that's mainly for millimeter wave. Uh, the intention of that is that during the course of, of a number of them symbols, the, you have face noise, so the, the face of the local oscillator at the transmitter may, may drift a bit. And in order to track that on the receiver side, you, you can add this PTRS in the time domain. It, it's sparse in the frequency domain, but a little bit dense in the time domain so that you can track the channel variations. Uh, so one can actually see this as some kind of extension to the DMRs because it only occurs when you transmit data. In the same way as DMRs, that only occurs when you have a data transmission ongoing and only in that part of the frequency region. All to be lean, ultra lean. So when, when there's no data transmission, there's no, no DMRs or PTRs either. So is this a multiple carriers or, or multiple subcarriers or just one? Uh, each, each. Uh, this is one subcarrier here. And if you schedule a wider bandwidth, then it will be another red set uh, over here somewhere. So it's a CRB. Yeah, it will get another uh, subcarrier here and another one up here somewhere. But it's relatively sparse, much sparse in the frequency domain than the, the, than the DMRs because the only thing you want to track is the time variations. And it's mainly useful for millimeter where you, you typically don't need them at, at the lower frequency bands. And it, it's again configurable, you, you tell the UV or, or you tell the UV that the base station has those, if, depending on whether you want them or not. Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit more about uh, the multi-antenna setup and the channel state acquisition. Now that we've gone through the, the transmission chain. Uh, as you remember from this F and W, you, you may want to know a little bit about the, the pre-coding matrix. Get some idea on what could be a good thing to do at the base station side in order to get a strong and high quality signal at the UV side. And that can be done in many ways. And one of the tools you have is this CSI RS, Channel State Information Reference Signals. It is uh, reference signals that we transmit. We have them over here in the 
insert from here after the W. So that the UV can measure on them and report back. And based on those measurements, the, the base that can figure out what, what the physical antenna mapping and the channel looks like and, and figure out a good W to use. And that's um, in 3D, yeah. Is it that for UV? Yeah, each U is configured with when to expect a CSI or when to do the measurement. Uh, and then you can, of course, configure multiple UVs so that they measure on the same CSIRs if you want to. And maybe that, that might be a good idea, so you save some CSIRs overhead. But you could also configure with, with different CSIRs measurements or just configure some of the measurements. So again, uh, see the specification from a UV perspective. The UV gets configuration what to do and that U is not aware of what other U's are doing. It doesn't care. It just does what the network told it to do. And uh, the, the network can tell the U to, to, now I have some periodic CSI hours. They, they occur at these blue occasions here, different periodicities and different shifts in time. And then the U measures on those and regular reports back. Or you can do a periodic reporting. It's some kind of one shot. Then the, you tell the U that now I will transmit one CSIRS. Please measure on that one. And the U does so and reports back. Or you can have a configuration that can activate or deactivate a little bit more rapidly, something in between those two. So it's a, quite a big flexibility and uh, when you can tell the U to measure and report something back. To the, to the base station. And then the base station can use that information to, to uh, figure out what would be a good way of transmitting the downlink to get good quality. Yeah, one question. Yeah. Uh, what's the delay that could be encountered while actually performing the entire reporting for the whole slot, for the whole transfer period? run? You mean how fast you, if you measure this one, how fast do you get to report back to the, to the base station? For the whole period. Yeah, I mean, you, you measure here and we report back here a few slots later. So somewhere here you have the knowledge in the base station. And yeah. somewhere here you get updated knowledge and so on. <clears throat> what would be the practical time for that? Uh, estimate of it, maybe? Maybe, maybe? maybe 10, 20, 30, 40 milliseconds, a few 10 milliseconds, something in that range. Okay, thank you. You, you can... Uh, you can probably con configure it to be a quite frequent in a few milliseconds apart. Uh, that comes at the cost that's over uh, on overhead. And I don't remember the, the most sparse one you can have, but that's several tens of milliseconds, but something in that range, I would say. Thank you. If you do the periodic one, then you can do the aperiodic one, then you just tell the UA measure and the UA measures and reports back. And that's a one shot. It doesn't do anything more until you ask it again. And then the CSIRS, uh, again, flexibility. Uh, but it basically, you take a number of uh, time, frequency, resource element, and depending on how many different CSIRSs you would like to, to code multiplex, you can do different different setup, setups here. So here. Here we have a setup for four and eight port CSIRS. Four groups separating from each domain and then code multiplexing within each of these colors. So we can code multiplex four of them in, in two frequent domain resources in different ways. So you can play around with it. Doesn't matter too much right now how, how we configure it, but, but you, you can mesh on those CSIRs and, and report back. That's the main thing to remember. And then the CSIRs, how they are mapped to the antenna ports, that's defined in specification. So if I have set up two CSIRs sets, one number one and one number two, they go through different F matrices. I can have different antenna, for example, physical beam direction. So I know the CSIR goes in this direction, that corresponds to F1, and CSIRs2 goes in another direction, would correspond to, to F2. And then there are some, some restrictions. Like we haven't talked about the uh, QCL relations, uh, but the UE can, can make some assumptions on that CSIRS 1 and 2 belong to different F matrices, and that, that could be 
be useful in, in some setups, but we don't go through the, the details on, on the F setups is, is not in spec, just that it, it doesn't change over time. So if I if I do a periodic measurement on, on set number one, I know it's the same F1 time after time after time, but that doesn't change too often. So this F is complete, completely secret in some sense. So from the yeah. US perspective, it's just part of the channel. Yeah, from from the UA. I mean, this is what you will see in, in in the channel. It it measures after the radio channel, something happens from the antenna ports, and that something is the F matrix and the whole radio channel. Okay. And then then we're back to this figure, as you remember, we have some precoding W that is fisk antenna set up with the CSIRs and the radio channel and. Uh, you have the full freedom to, to use whatever W and F you want, but from for a CSI reporting, you assume a certain code books. When you measure on the CSI RS, uh, you can't have an infinite number of W's in the reporting function. In the transmission side, you may, but reporting wise, you have a table. These are the possible W's. Please tell me which one is the, the best one. And then the, the, you can report back it's, it's index number five that is the best w and then use that w and it also reports back the, the transmission rank and the modulation and coding scheme so you can re report back to the base station that yes uh, the best thing you can do is two layer rank two transmission with uh, code book number five and i recommend the uh, 64 quam with a code rate of one half that you can report back and suggest to the, to the base station, and then the base station does whatever it wants. In many cases, it of course makes sense to follow the U recommendation, but uh, you don't have to. So that's the, the downlink setup. And then you have a similar thing in, in the uplink. It's a little bit, uh, here we have a little bit more flexibility when it comes to the, the beamforming setup, but the the CSI acquisition is kind of similar. You transmit sounding reference signals in the uplink that will correspond to the CSI RS in the downlink. And again, they can be periodic so that you tell the UV to transmit to every 10 milliseconds or whatever. Uh, you can tell the UV to transmit every 10 milliseconds, but you can turn on and off that pattern in a fast way. Or you can tell the UV to do one shot sounding on the uplink uh, by just asking to please sound uplink and then you measure on the on the base station side. And then after that, you get some knowledge of, of the uplink quality. And uh, we don't need to go into details on the code sequence here. It's, it's a basic comp that you, you have flexibility here as well with, with the different sequences you can send. And then again, quite similar as in the downlink, the, the UE transmits the, the SRS. It passes through whatever antenna arrangement the UE has, uh, go through the radio channel, and measured by the base station. And uh, similar to the downlink, we don't say anything about the multi antenna arrangement in the U. If you want to try to implement this with two antenna elements or 10 or 56, or if, you, if you're inside or outside the U or wherever they are, that, that's kind of secret from the base station. But you can make certain assumptions on the F as we will see in the coming slide. So if I configure two sounding reference signals, I can sound maybe two different beam directions from the UV. One that where the U is beam forming in that direction and another where the U is beam forming in that direction. So that's the way the, the base station can get the information about the uplink channel quality from this sounding mechanism. And it can of course use that knowledge also for figuring out good things in the downlink. Or you can use the downlink measurement to figure out <laughs> recommendations what the U should do in the uplink. So it's not by stated that you must use the SRS only for uplink scaling. You can use it for downlink as well if you if you do this reciprocity based beam form, for example. And then the same scheme again from a data the modulation perspective, you don't care about the W, but since you want to be able to instruct the, the UE to use a certain W in uplink, there is a table in the in the specification that the base station can tell the U that transmitting the uplink with this state rate and so on using this W, and then the, the base station does so. 
that would be code would based be pre-coding. And then you typically do an SRS to measure the channel, and then you, you figure out what W that is good, and then they tell the the, the, the UV to use that W. But you can also do a non-code book based pre-coding. Then the UV would measure in the downlink uh, and uh, provide recommendation, and then by itself select the W. We, we'll get to that in, in a slide or two. So Stefan, so yep. the difference between uplink and downlink, if I now follow is that in downlink F is just at the discretion mm -hmm. of the base station, whereas in uplink F is specified. No, not really. It's W that's specified, I would say. Uh, F, it's still pretty much up to the, the U implementation. So you, you can't assume a certain F, but you can assume that the F properties stay the same from an SRS transmission to the data transmission. Okay, so both are kind of the, at the discretion of implementation. Yes, that, that's the, with F, I try to model the, the whatever implementation you have. And with W, it's, it's more what might be known for the other end. Okay. I think but, but, yeah. but this statement about in the previous slide, so there was a statement about the SRS transmission and push relations uh, okay. so for are specified. So there's yeah. some which so is that, that it basically said that if I transmit the sounding reference signals in the uplink, and the, the base station measures something and, and comes to conclusion on, on what, what W to use in the UV. That, of course, assumes a certain F. We don't know which F, but we know that the, the, the UV had some antenna arrangement with a certain F. If I then use this uplink measurement to schedule data a little bit later and uh, recommend uh, or tell the UV to use a certain W, then, of course, the, the, the UV is not allowed to play around and use a completely different F at that data transition point a little bit later in time, because then, then my scheduling decision would be a stupid one. Okay. So it's basically so that the UV promises to keep F the same from SRS transmission to data transmission. Okay. That's what was specified. And I think that, that is basically what, what, what we have here. This would be if I want to do uplink transmission with code book based pre coding, I basically would do what we have on this slide. So I start with, with uh, as the UV to, to some, some sounding reference signals, maybe two different ones, two different sets that could correspond to two different beam directions in the UV. I measure in, in, the, in the base station. I take a decision that, okay, I think it was good to transmit. I sent an SRI index. That's basically an SRS resource indicator. And in this case, I recommend number two. So I, I want the UV to use whatever F matrix it used when it founded referencing this two. And then I, I tell it that rank four was good and use this pre coder W with a certain index. I tell that to the UV. And then the UV transmits. Rank four transmissions in this beam direction that correspond to SRS number two, using that precode that the base station told me to use, and then I receive the data. So, so here you mean now that this F that F two would correspond to actually four beam directions if you use rank four, I, right? Well, yeah, it is one. I would say one beam direction, but about four four layers. Of course, in this beam direction, there must be at least four transmission antennas. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, again, this is what, what is specified. If I measure on this F matrix, that must be the same F matrix that is used to transmit in that direction. But is the F matrix rank one? No, I mean, if, 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 I, if it's a rank four transmission, then it must be at least rank four. Okay. So I mean, I, mean, I can't do a rank four transmission with, with just one transmission antenna. So I have four transmission antennas in some arrangement, maybe two cross polarized antennas or so that basically forms goes in this direction. And th this direction, that could be uh, antennas on the other side of the UV, for example, that, that would point in that direction or backwards or, or whatever it could be. Okay. But the F matrix must at least have the same rank as the, the, the rank at the schedule, otherwise it, it, it wouldn't work. But they could, of course, have rank eight if I have a super exclusive UV with a lot of antennas. 
but I still may choose just to use four, four layers for some reason. So this is codebook based pre-coding. Then the base version is a complete control of, of everything that this U is doing and is based on the idea is to use uplink uh, sounding to figure out what, what uh, pre-coding, what W to use. Then we also have non-codebook based pre-coding. Uh, that then basically the the dub the um, precoding the W is chosen by the the handset. So the thinking here is that I I, I use reciprocity. So I have some CSI R's in the downlink. The UE measures on that, and the UE takes by itself a conclusion that these four directions seems to be promising. The ones going in this direction seems to be useless because I didn't receive a strong signal there. But these are the, the four best uh, received signals in that direction when I measure on CSIR. So I have four candidate, uh, so the beams or, or things I, I, I can transmit in. And then the UV sensor sounding reference signals in all four of these. The base station measures. The base station came to the conclusion that number one and number three were, were good ones. Okay. So the base station tells the U that use number one and number three, but not the other ones. And then the, the handset knows, okay, I should just use W1 and W3, that, that subset of the pre-coding matrix. So that is what it does, it uses that W. And in this case, the, the, the base station doesn't know which W the the uh, the U is using, but the, it can still demodulate the data because the demodulation referencing is go through the same pre-coding codebook. So the only influence that the, the base station had here was to, to select a subset of these four most prominent candidates that the, the U used. So the, the the W selection in this case is on the device side, not on the network side. So that is non-codebook based pre-coding. That of course gives the the device more freedom in designing a good pre-coder. It doesn't have to use some of the, the pre-configured or list of pre-codes in spec. It can use whatever pre-code it wants to, but limited to, to the subset that the network decides is a good choice out of that codebook. So that is non-codebook based pre-coding and uplink. So you have both of these possibilities that you could configure. That was actually it for, for this session. So after lunch, uh, I did to start to talk about scheduling and retransmissions and, and some of these things. And then these um, slide sets after lunch, there are a little bit, uh, I think there are a little bit fewer slides in those than the, the ones before lunch. So hopefully you can have lunch and still stay awake and listen to them. <laughs> we'll try. So the first session after lunch is, is tough sometimes, depending what you eat. <laughs> so are there any questions? Stefan, now for the two first parts. Uh, hi, hi, Stefan. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I I'm wondering uh, roughly uh, how much time will a UE or base station need to complete the whole tran uh, transmission procedure? Uh, is in a millisecond scale or uh, a few millisecond or uh, more? Well, yeah, okay, one or a few milliseconds. It depends a little bit what, what the base station needs. On the base station side, it depends how, how big a schedule you design, of course. And But in, in principle, when, when the data arrives to base station, you can take a decision immediately, and uh, more or less the next OPTM symbol, transmit that data in the downlink. Uh, so I, I would say in a millisecond or so, in that, that range. But you may, of course, also choose that, okay, the data that came here in the downing, that was uh, background, not that important. So I, that has to wait because I'm busy with, with some other very urgent data that I want to transmit first. And uh, uh, why is the bottleneck in the whole procedure? Well, because uh, it seems, uh, well, a uh, uh, dominate uh, procedure, uh, a block dominate all the... Uh, yeah. I would say in the in the downlink, um, yeah. I mean the, the scheduling decision as such is very simple in the downlink because you you can take it as soon as you get data and then then just transmit. 
and the uh, typically in the downlink, the control signaling comes immediately before the, the data. So that is very quick. And then, of course, when taking the downlink scheduling decision, you need to base that on some uh, some channel estimate, some some knowledge about radio channel. And that radio channel, depending on how old that is, the decision gets more or less uh, accurate. I mean, maybe I haven't received any CSI feedback from that particular UV the last 20 milliseconds or so. So then you have to, to use whatever you have. Uh, you can, of course, wait until you get new channels from the UV and, and hopefully make a more accurate scheduling decision at the price of taking it a little bit later. But that, that's up to your implementation. In the uplink, uh, since you take the scheduling decision in, in the base station, you send the scheduling grant to the device. And then the, the device needs to prepare the data transmitted. That is a little bit longer time than in the downlink, because then you need to send the, the and, and maybe also before that, you need to know that the device had data. So the device will act, actually tell the base station, I have data to transmit. Base station takes a scheduling decision, tells you that yes, transmit on these resources, and then the U transmits mm -hmm. it up. So that, that is a little bit, uh, may take a little bit longer. And we, we see that actually after lunch on, on the scheduling request and so on. But also in that case, you, you're talking about uh, where, depending on whether you need a scheduling request or not, but we, we, we still talk about milliseconds. Yeah, so, uh, thank you. Uh, maybe just one comment. Uh, the non code book pre coding that you mentioned in the last slide, essentially. Uh, is it like, yeah, so isn't this like essentially a beam steering problem for the UEs? Yeah, you can say so. I mean, the, the, the UE tries the four most promising uh, beam directions, and then the, the, the base station says that uh, the, these were the ones that were, were the best. So essentially, if it chooses a very fluid uh, W values, which are like very close to each other, essentially it's like steering a beam in a particular direction only. Yeah, I mean, it can of course have uh, four beams in that direction and then another four in this direction. And then uh, it turned out that on this side, I didn't receive much of a signal. On this side of you, I received a strong signal in the downlink, so let's try uh, these are the most due to reciprocity. These are the most promising yep. candidates, and then I, I sound those four. So, uh, is it possible to actually do like a prediction mechanism on top of this? Yeah. Well, what do what do you mean with prediction mechanism? So, if you if you know in the previous time step what beam you are using, is it possible to predict it based on your mobility aspect? Ah, oh, okay. So you mean that. Um, I, I was um, in, okay here. I was hearing that uh, maybe the top beam were, were the best one, but I know that I'm moving, so I know that in a millisecond those antennas on the side would be the best. Hence, I assume those. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, that, that you can do if you want to. It's, it's up to you. Uh, might be. Uh, it sounds difficult, but uh, you're allowed to do these kind of things if you can in, on the U side. And in some cases, maybe it's easier. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, in that regard, I've, I've read a, recently I've read a paper of uh, in molecular communication where they use uh, like uh, gyroscopes. Exactly. To get, so for instance, Fakari is on a bumpy road using yep. uh, the information of accelerometer, they can correct the, uh, the deformity of the street to keep communicating with, for instance, the car ahead of it. So I think it's that people do is, I mean, it's essentially it's some sort of beam tracking at UE. Yeah. UE but I mean, and that's one of the reasons why I have this non codebook book speaker that you can do things on your own in you. And if you can use your accelerometer or something else to, to do something smarter, feel free to do so. That, yeah. Then you can exploit that mechanism. The standard won't stop you. Whereas the, the, the code book based here, I mean, that would be a little bit trickier to, to exploit your accelerometer and the bumper road on the U side here. So that, that's a benefit of this one. I have a question. In a in a coordinated, maybe also multi-stage beam uh, alignment, uh, not alignment, but yes, beam alignment problem. Uh, the the procedure would work uh, like this one in this slide, but uh, two ways and repeated multiple times, or how, how yeah, would be some something like that. You can say. I mean, the, the, you you start by it's done in such a way that you can tra transmit in the downlink in one direction, then the UV can scan through its reception beam, so to say, and vice versa. So then you have to do a little bit of 
trying on both ends. Okay, I'm going back to the previous question. So <laughs> this, proce this procedure takes time. So yeah. again, I mean, to, to me, it looks like a lengthy procedure. If you have to do coordinated beam search at two ends, you need to go back and forth reporting measurements. Beam is like something that uh, is not really lightweight. No, no it depends. I mean, uh, of course, it depends on how narrow the beams are and so on. But if you, if you find the beams that, that match each other and you start to transmit data, then you, you can transmit slot after slot after slot with data. And, Still, the UV can try some some neighboring beams as well with the SRS. It can still scan all the kind of SRS directions like this, and then the base station still just picks one of them. And if later on this beam was was, was better on the base station, uh, that we can see also from the base station, it can measure all these SRSs in different directions. Mm -hmm. So maybe later on the, the base station figures out by itself that there should be from like this, and they select as beam zero instead of beam one. So you, you can do it a little bit, uh, the, the tracking thing you can do while you transmit data. Then of yeah. course, if the beam is completely opposite the side of you, uh, so then, then you may lose your, then you may, may have a beam beam failure, so to say, you have to, to restart yeah, well, your alignment. I was thinking of a user that has never used, uh, I mean, it's just joined the system mm -hmm. and he wants to find out where to send. So from scratch, without any prior information, how... Yeah. It would be that procedure. We, we, we will see a little bit on that in the, I think it was the, yeah, the last session, the, the initial access, how you, you figure out which beam to use initially. And then you have a good starting point to do your data transmission in those beams. And once you're up and running, you can do this kind of fine tuning. But okay. sometimes it happens that, that, that you lose the connection, that you the beams are misaligned, and then you have to restart that alignment procedure. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay. Okay. Lunchtime, I guess. Thank okay. you.